So when we have introduced this uh, uh, wave equation, we kind of end things here and we don't, um, we haven't covered in the lecture, like where does this wave equation come from? I mean, it is a super important part of description of wave. Um, whenever you are uh, dealing with some wave phenomena, your starting place is the wave equation. So let me just copy over here on the screen what I have written down there. Wave equation, it takes this form. Uh, this isn't the only wave equation, but it's the one that you will see in this class. It's a second order partial differential equation of a function that's both of a position and time. Um, and there's some constant coefficient here. And there's the second order derivative with respect to time. And when we talk about solution, uh, like uh, wave functions, uh, we are talking about solutions to this wave equation. And what we don't really talk about in detail in lecture is where does this wave equation come from? It's just uh, plucked uh, from sky, like it's given to you by God. And, and it, the true picture isn't like that. The, the answer to the question, where does the wave equation come from? It, uh, it comes from physics. And one of the reasons I don't give the explicit description of where the wave equation comes from is it's a really situation dependent. It, so you will see this wave equation derived in physics 4B. If you take physics 4B with me, then the very last thing we do at the end of the semester is use something called the Maxwell's equations that describes electromagnetism and drive a wave equation for electromagnetic waves. And so it comes from physics, <laughs> that's one example. And, um, and each physical situation you have, how this wave equation comes about, it'll be situation dependent because it's very specific to the physical setup that you are looking at. And um, I think it's worthwhile to look at at least one specific example that we use a lot, that I use a lot, the waves on a string. And your textbook does have a fairly good uh, description of that. And I think what's uh, probably the best uh, use of our time here is um, just reading through the section. I uh, kind of skimmed over it before the session and I think it's uh, decent. <laughs> I don't see the point in reinventing the wheel. And, and you know, this is one of those derivations that's um, subtle, um, not complicated. It's a, um, it's involved enough that uh, whenever I cover it, I wouldn't need to do some prep myself. <laughs> so I wouldn't trust myself to just uh, do it from scratch uh, correctly without any prep. And um, if I'm doing it with a textbook section in front of me, I'll be going through most of the same steps that the textbook is. So I, I think what's good for us to do is just read it through the section together. And maybe for me to clarify some of the things that the textbook is doing, you know, some of the things that they don't fully explain that I can tack on my explanation. So, yeah, so I guess I should just read out loud. Um, yeah, I, I know everyone knows how to read. This is more for just the pacing of the this particular lecture section. <laughs> it's not that long. It won't take too long for me to read out loud. <clears throat> Um, so this is from section 16.3, wave speed on a stretchless string. The speed of a wave depends on the characteristics of the medium. For example, in the case of a guitar, the strings vibrate to produce the sound. The speed of the waves on the strings and the wavelength oh, <laughs> determine the frequency of the sound produced. So the the subject is the speed of the waves on the strings. That's the primary thing, determine the frequency of the sound produced. And I think this is tecton, which is why there's a comma. The strings on a guitar have different thickness, but may be made of a similar material. They have different linear densities, uh, where the linear density is defined as mass per length. 
um, this is one of going to be one of the parameters you will see in the expression for the wave speed of a stream. Uh, mu, um, the symbol that we use, uh, mu, in case you haven't seen it before, it's uh, spelled out with the Roman alphabets as mu, uh, uh, pronounced like mu, <laughs> not mu, uh, <laughs> I do. Um, it's a mass of the string per length of the string. Uh, depending on the question, they might give you this directly or give you the quantities that you can use to compute it from. Okay. In this chapter, we consider only strings with a constant linear density. If the linear density is constant, then the mass delta m of a small length of string, uh, string delta x is, uh, delta m is equal to mu times delta x. For example, if the string has a length of two meters and a mass of 0 0.06 kilogram, then the linear density is, it is some calculation. <laughs> if a 1.00 millimeter section is cut from the string, the mass of the 1.00 millimeter length is, and uh, some calculation. Uh, so when I read through technical text like textbook, um, I like to skip over these equations like this, at least on the first read. And if I recognize them as being important for the comprehension of the text, then I would go back and read it. But a lot of the times uh, you can skip the equations and it'll be fine. So that's why I'm saying just skipping a page four. The guitar also has a method to change the tension of the strings. Uh, the tension of the strings is adjusted by turning spindles called the tuning pegs around which the strings are wrapped. Uh, for the guitar, the linear density of the string and the tension in the string determining the speed of the waves in the string and the frequency of the sound that produced is proportional to the wave speed. And uh, I guess in this section, they are not making it explicit. There's also standing waves stuff happening. Uh, that's chapter 70 material. <laughs> um, so wave speed on a string under tension. To see how the speed of a wave on a string depends on the tension and the linear density, consider a pulse centered on the top string. Um, I think the figure that they, that's not, a, oh, they, I guess they are describing a top string. Okay, so let me just, uh, let's just look at this figure. This is a top string. And what's important in the description of this is they are drawing two tension forces that are acting on this segment of the string that they have to be equally magnitude because this section is an accelerating in either direction along the string. So, um, so that's what this figure is illustrating. Yeah, it's in static equilibrium. When the top string is at rest at the equilibrium position, the tension in the string FT is constant. Uh, sure, I guess <laughs> that's one way to same. Consider a small element of the string with a mass equal to delta n is equal to mu times delta x. The mass element is at rest and in equilibrium and the force of tension of either side of the mass element is equal and opposite. Okay. If you plug a string under tension, uh, transverse waves moves in the positive x direction as shown in the figure below this figure. And uh, oh, um, and just because this is a kind of stationary figure, and sometimes with the stationary figures, there can be some sources of misunderstanding. Let me just uh, uh, make sure you have the right uh, mental image in mind as you look at that particular figure. This is the my favorite simulation on uh, FED simulation website. I think it's called Wave on a String. And uh, it's uh, really great for uh, illustrating waves, uh, especially transverse waves, which is the only thing it can illustrate. So, uh, wait. Um, so I guess the easiest thing to do here is for me to show a pulse. So let me just do it as a slow motion so I can um, <laughs> have time to stop the thing. So when you send down a pulse along the string, then you can imagine this as being a kind of this pulse. So this is a snapshot as a moment in time. And over time, what you have to imagine is, um, so this, uh, or I guess this mass element here, 
it's going to be uh, accelerating or moving downward. As you can see here, um, if I'm looking at uh, this green bead here, over next few moments in time, this green bead is moving down <coughs> downward. And so, so there's a vertical motion up and down. So if you imagine mass elements on this side, as the wave moves across, this mass element moves up, and then it pauses at the top here, and then it moves down. Or if you imagine tracking this green bead, as the wave moves across it, it moves up until it reaches a top point here, and then it moves down. So there's going to be a kind of an oscillatory thing happening with any particular given um, um, string element. And that's what you should imagine as we go through this analysis. So we were at, uh, yeah, shown in figure. The mass element is small, but is enlarged in the figure to make it visible. Uh, it's gonna be infinitesimal size um, in our analysis. The small mass element oscillates perpendicular to the wave motion as a result of the restoring force provided by the string and does not move in the X direction. As you saw in the simulation, this will oscillate up and down, not left and right for transverse wave, which is wave on the string. Um, the tension Ft in the string, which acts in the positive and negative X direction, is approximately constant and is independent of position and time. And I guess I agree with that, um, approximately. You can imagine if uh, you are uh, shaking the string violently, it might um, it not be constant, so you stay away from it. <laughs> you stay at the small amplitude region. Um, so I think it might be good to have this image uh, somewhere accessible as we walk through the remainder. Um, Okay, um, so assume that the inclination of the displaced string with respect to the horizontal, like this dotted line, this inclination is small. So what they are having you do is they are having you make this uh, approximation that that the angles theta one and theta two expressed in radians is much less than one. They are using the small angle approximation that you have seen elsewhere in the course. Um, and so it's good to keep in mind what this small angle approximation involves. It, uh, it implies the following things for the common trig functions. For uh, sine of theta, uh, it means it's approximately equal to theta itself expressed in the radians. And tangent of theta, is also approximately equal to theta itself. And this last one is the most important one. That's why I want you to point this out. Because without this understanding, some of what they say in the derivation can get confusing. Um, most importantly, cosine of theta under the small angle approximation is approximately one. So uh, for angles are small, so it, what it comes down to is if you imagine a right triangle like this, a small angle, then, so as you change the angle, you can see this hypotenuse, um, let's see. Um, as you change the angle, imagine you are keeping the hypotenuse the same. Then in terms of the, the opposite side, which is related to sine of theta, that's going to change proportional to theta. But the adjacent side, which is related to cosine, this we are going to treat as being constant. That's the, the, that's the, the details of the assumptions we are making when we are uh, making small angle approximation as the rest of the discussion in textbook. So, um, yeah, assume that is small. <laughs> the net force on the element of the string, I think parallel to the string is the sum of the tension in the string and the restoring force. The X component of the force of the tension cancel. So, so it's this uh, approximation here that allows you to say that your force of tension 
is um, approximately in the horizontal direction, or more precisely, what they are illustrating here is the X component of the force of tension. And under this small angle approximation, they can say that this is equal to the force of tension. Uh, because the force of tension is really along the string. It's not, uh, that, that force of tension along the string is where they get this vertical component. This is the Y component of the force of the tension. And um, the expressions they write down saying that the FT on this side is equal to FT on this side, even though their Y components will be different, uh, is because of, of this approximation here. What they are really expressing is that the X component of the, the force of tension is equal to on both sides because the string, the this uh, string element is not accelerating horizontally. So you know, the X components of the force of tension cancel. So the net force is equal to the sum of the Y components of the force. The magnitude of the X component of the force is equal to the horizontal force of tension of the string FT, uh, which is approximately equal to FT self, as is shown in figure. Um, is that the same figure? Yeah, it's shown in figure. To obtain the Y components of the force, note that tangent theta one here is equal to minus F1 over FT. That's the exact expression for tangent. Uh, and tangent theta two is rise over the, um, or the, up. if you're drawing a triangle that looks like this, this is the opposite over the adjacent. Same thing, the opposite over the adjacent. Um, Tangent theta two is F2 over FT. And I believe they are, keep, are they keeping things in general? Um, well, so I guess here theta one, they are letting theta one become negative, I think. Uh, tangent theta is equal to the slope of a function at a point, which is equal to the partial derivative of Y with respect to X at that point. So. This is the equation they're writing down to express that. Uh, therefore, the F1 over FT is equal to the negative slope of the string at X1. F2 over FT is equal to the slope of the string at X2. Uh, and X1 and X2, we are keeping them as two separate locations here and here, and they're gonna address the facts. The net force on the small mass element can be written as, the net force, uh, sum of F1 plus F2. And it looks like they are, um, so to make a sense of this, I think that they are letting the variable F1 itself become negative. So um, that's why they are just, to put, so they are adding this as a vector quantities. And uh, I hope to all the signs will work out. Yeah, I guess this minus sign here will uh, address that sign. It's uh, F1 being downward with this positive slope is handled with this minus sign. So FT times, uh, this is coming from F2, the, y, uh, the partial derivative Y of X at the position X2, plus this term, which is minus, uh, partial derivative Y with respect to X at position X1. Using Newton's second law, the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. The linear density of the string mu is the mass per length of the string, and the mass of the portion of the string is mu times this delta x here, the distance a bit from here to here. And again, they are um, using this uh, small angle approximation that cosine theta is approximately one. So the, you can treat the length along the hypotenuse, basically being the same as the length along the adjacent side. This delta x is really the length along the adjacent side. But under small angle approximation, all this is fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is the expression written out, Newton's second law, mass. Uh, you have to be careful here. The delta m here is not difference in mass. It's the kind of small amount of mass, what someone might call infinitesimal mass. Why it's so hard to sum up there. The delta m there is the infinitesimal amount of mass that's associated with delta x, which is actually different symptom. Um, 
so yeah, the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And the next step is just writing out what the mass, uh, the small amount of mass is, mu times delta x, and the acceleration. So they are looking at acceleration of the segment along the y direction. So they are saying double partial derivative of y with respect to t time. So, um, so, so this is their uh, equation of motion <laughs> that you, we might have, we, we were writing down when we were doing oscillation. And having written down this equation of motion, they will now uh, introduce a couple additional calculus steps and uh, simplify it until it looks like wave equation so that we can identify some of the parameters uh, with this uh, speed that we have occurring in our wave equation. So uh, dividing by this number, force uh, and delta x. And uh, um, <laughs> so when you look at derivation, sometimes you will see this. Uh, I say this is a poorly motivated step. And what it really means is it, when and if people ask, why were you dividing by this number? Um, oftentimes there isn't really a good answer why, just looking at this except maybe if you look forward to where you are trying to get to, then it makes sense. So you want to get rid of FT and you want to put delta X on the denominator here. Um, the, and doing this does that. But it, this is the kind of the derivation step that you will be seeing <laughs> as you uh, move into higher levels of uh, math and engineering and science. Um, it's, that's one of the reasons to read the textbooks because these steps are not always obvious or intuitive. Um, you kind of have to follow along someone who's done these non-obvious steps. So dividing by this, um, you will get this expression here. That's uh, the <laughs> selection really doesn't work well. So having divided, you end up with this expression here. This is what you have right after the division. FT is canceled out, you have delta X on the denominator. On the right-hand side, delta X got canceled out and you have FT on the denominator. Okay, um, so they are both in your equation somehow. And they say, taking the limit as delta X approaches zero, you are making this uh, uh, string element infinitesimally small. This is the calculus step. And when you do that, it, it helps, this is, um, why it helps to uh, not skip the things in your uh, math class, even the ones that look esoteric and maybe things that you might think, oh, when, I'm, when am I ever gonna use this? Uh, like the definition of derivative uh, in terms of limits and um, <laughs> with all the derivative and integration formulas you have to memorize in calculus, maybe things like this um, get lower priority, but if you remember definition of derivative, that's when you can recognize expressions like this. You stare at this for a while, you realize that these two are basically the same functional form uh, evaluated at two different positions, two positions that are relatively close to each other by distance delta x. You are taking difference between them and then dividing by delta x and you are taking the limit that delta x goes to zero. All of this um, should remind you of the definition of derivative. So what we are doing with this left-hand side is taking the derivative of this function here, the partial derivative of y with respect to x first order. So since you're taking a, another derivative with respect to x, uh, it becomes the second order derivative as you take the limit x, delta x approaches to. Right hand side remains the same. And with all those stuff, you end up with uh, this as your final result. This is the, this is your equation of motion. And uh, it, it's, uh, it, this comes directly from, oops, uh, it, from the equation of motion that uh, we started out above, a few lines above. And when you look at this function, compare it to the wave equation, you see that it has all the parts. Oh, oh sorry, <laughs> not that. Um, this is the equation that we end up with. 
and I'm just going to use my own version of the wave equation. When you look at this equation here, and uh, this is our equation of motion for the, the string element, you see that it has um, all the parts that we had in the wave equation. We have the second partial derivative with respect to x. We have second partial derivative with respect to time. And really what this comes down to is matching this constant coefficient with this constant coefficient, mu over ft. So we say uh, one over speed squared is equal to linear mass density over force of tension. And this is a list of formula that, um, that I recommend that you memorize, and I have ever memorized since undergraduate days. The wave speed on a string is given by square root of the tension force divided by linear mass density. Yeah, this is one of those formulas that's uh, relatively easy to memorize and um, driving it from scratch can be a bit of a pain. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, 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 those are really the only formulas I recommended to memorize, you know, ones that are hard to drive and easy to memorize. So solving for V, you get that. Um, so, so that's the wave speed on a string. And as I was saying, your textbook covers fairly uh, thoroughly, unlike the uh, wave speed of the compression wave that they will just give you the formula of. Um, and um, yeah, and so I recommend the reading through it. And if any of the sections were um, not, um, not clear, then this is my attempt at trying to add some additional detail on some of the uh, approximations that they didn't fully spell out. And yeah, some of the waves, they just, uh, uh, mm -hmm. all right, that's interesting. <laughs> so here they just give you the formula for, uh, so this uh, with the uh, speed of the longitudinal wave, that's a sound wave. So this uh, uh, could be describing a uh, speed of the sound. Wave. I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we won't go into detail there. 